Okay, we are live, looks like. I have now started the broadcast. This is Jay Smith. It is 11.03 in the morning here in the United States. It's even earlier where Al-Fadi is. Al-Fadi, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. How about, How about you? you? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so we're ready to go. Now, let's go ahead and since we since we're this is in some ways this is the second what well, this is the second time that we've ever done any hangouts like this and uh it's it's brilliant because this is the first time that i've been able to, uh, to get it get it going uh with my technician in united kingdom hello to our technician in united kingdom he doesn't want his name to be broadcast so we won't give you his name uh, but he is four o'clock in the afternoon i am 11 in the morning uh, you're in, uh, about nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning, aren't you, Al Fadi? That's right. Well, that's a big mug you've got there. It is promotion for Sierra. <laughs> Say something quickly about Sierra and who you are and, and why we're doing and what we're going to be doing today. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so this is Al Fadi. I'm a former Muslim from Saudi. Some of you already know that. And uh, the ministry that uh, I was able to found about 10 years ago, it's called the Sira International. Sira stands for the Center for Islamic Research and Awareness. And um, uh, I love what Jay does. And, uh, you know, it's it's just God's timing that he and I uh, intersected as we both are focused on the Quran in our studies and also in our ministry. And today we are going to be talking about uh, the uh, compilation of the Quran. At least we are going to try to uh, critically analyze uh, both of those events that are mentioned in the Islamic traditions, the one during Abu Bakr's time, and then if time allows, of course, uh, the one during Uthman. But even if we didn't finish it today, I'm sure we'll continue on with that. At least that's some of what will be covered today. Okay, so it's this book right here. This is the book that we're going to be looking at. Now, the, uh, the reason Al Fadi and I are really zeroing in on the Quran is because this is your expertise, is it not, Al Fadi? This is what you're doing your doctorate on. That is correct. I'm I'm focused on the early Quranic manuscript right now. Say something a little bit about that. I mean, what what do you mean by early Quranic manuscript, okay. and what about this? It's a sauna, particularly. If you could just give a little background, because that will help people realize not only your caliber but why this interests you so much. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, by the way, uh, just uh, an academic thing. Anytime uh, people hear us say early Quran, it's always the 7th, 8th century, possibly pushing the 9th century. So that's the time frame that we focus on. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if you are really a serious scholar and an honest also seeker uh, about the truth concerning the Quran, you will discover so quickly that in those uh, early uh, centuries of the Quran, 7th, 8th, and 9th, we don't have such a thing as a complete Quran that matches today's 1924 edition known as the Kyrene one. And that's why you hear Jay, you hear me, you hear others always using the 1924 saying, you know, if you can find us one in early uh, times of Islam that matches this, bring it on. Now, we do understand that there is at least one codex that, uh, you know, technically speaking, is almost complete. That was an eighth, late eighth century, possibly. Um, and uh, that's the one that is found in the top copy in Turkey. But even that one has variants galore. I mean, we're talking a lot of differences. And this is why we always insist on giving us a complete one that is perfectly matching the one that we have today. So I developed this fashion really a couple of years ago when I was tracking with Jay and also I had the opportunity to apply for PhD and I got accepted and I wanted to study something that is unique. And I came across the, something called the Sana Manuscript. And uh, the Sana Manuscript is known as Palimpsest. And the Palimpsest mean that there was a perishment that was discovered that has been erased and rewritten over it. So that's what we mean by that. So the palm says the one that I'm focused on has approximately 38 folio, although we don't have all of them in one location. And uh, the lower layer uh, basically uh, has been erased and the upper layer was uh, added on top of it and it was discovered in 1972 by a group that was doing remodel at the great mosque in Sana'a, Yemen, which is the capital of Yemen. And uh, one of it, one of that group was a uh, German couple, 
uh, you know, her poem and his wife, Elizabeth poem. And then later uh, in early 80s, they've done some extensive studies and they continue to do studies. And they discovered, of course, that the I'll lower funny, layer. I'm funny, just to back up, is am I, yeah. it, this is not unusual to find uh, manuscripts like this uh, that are housed, or you might say that are hidden away in the domes of mosques. As uh, manuscripts start to deteriorate, they do not burn them, they do not destroy them. They would house them uh, in the mosques as a practice, and many times they just get forgotten. And That's in right. this case, these were forgotten, am I correct? That is correct, and and because they found them in this false ceiling, you know, we can call it an attic, and call it, you know, um, a, a fake storage. But uh, you're right, it was it was forgotten. It was thousands of them actually, but uh, the one I'm focused on only a portion of that, and uh, they discovered, like I said, just about, just because you're you're going very fast, so well, I'm going to keep slowing you down. Oh, absolutely. There, there's some things that really need to be pulled out here. These this manuscript it's that you're talking about. The reason why this was different than all the others is that the thousands that did fall to the ground were not really consequential because they all had diacritical marks, they had vowelization, which means they were much more recent. They were not really archaic manuscripts. But this one that fell to the ground, when the, uh, when the curators of the uh, Sana Mosque, when they looked at it, they could not read it because it did not have any diacritical marks. Uh, and right. this showed that it was much, much earlier much more archaic in fact one of the original manuscripts am i correct that that is correct that is correct and it's kind of interesting by the way that you mentioned that the arabs in yemen could not read it i mean what does that tell you about the way the quran was written in the early days that without the diacritical markings you won't be able really to decipher it correctly that's if you're even able to decipher it, because even the way things were written, some of the ahruf or some of the uh, letters were not written exactly the way the classical Arabic is done. And what Jay is referring to is that this particular one that I'm focused on didn't have any diacritical marking, so it made it even more difficult for people to understand. Now, initially, nobody really knew that this was a Quran until later it was was discovered that it was a Quran, and because it didn't have the diacritical markings, as you mentioned, Jay, yes, indeed, everybody got excited. It's like, oh, this is one of the very early ones. And soon enough, they began to do studies, serious studies, and realized that the lower layer didn't match today's Quran. So the assumption okay, would have been there. One more time. I'm going to keep stopping you because you're, you're, there are, there's some other things that we need to, the statement you made that they had not, they could not read it. So who did they bring in to read it? Because they had to fly in some experts, but where were those experts and where did they come from? Uh, they came from Germany, you know, primarily, but, uh, uh, you and know. Volkner, Oleg, Gary right. Quinn. Those are three scholars that they flew down in 1981. Von Volkner, Oleg, and Gerd Quinn. And fascinating, they had to fly down German scholars down to Yemen because there were no Arab scholars of the Arabic language who were adept enough to even read their own script. Now, what does that tell you about this kind of research in the Muslim world? Now, it's, it's, of course, it's extremely damaging. And at the same time, it shows that the Muslim world doesn't focus a lot on early manuscripts of the Quran. Yeah, we there is find... no such study. There, are, there exactly. is no institute anywhere in the Arab world or right. in the Muslim world to study archaic manuscripts. This just did not exist in the 1970s and the 1980s. And that's why in 1981, they had to bring these three scholars from Saarbrücken University, in Saarland University in Saarbrücken, which is Western Germany, to fly down because they were the only ones that could really look at it and understand it. And what did they do? They took pictures of it and they put them onto microfilms. Those exactly. microfilms then were confiscated from them. That's right. The Yemeni government, once they found out what they were hearing, once they found out what the Germans were finding, and when they saw the excitement on the Germans of what they had discovered, because they realized that this was the oldest manuscript that anybody had come across. Correct. And now, they were uh, you know, around 705, am I correct? Right. Now, Jay, you know, wh why would the government get so nervous? <laughs> <laughs> See, these are things that we're just saying off the top of our heads, but they each, everything you brought up in the last five minutes has huge significance when we're talking about textual criticism. Textual criticism has only ever really been done on the Bible. 
The exactly. Bible is the only book where textual, well, basically textual criticism, the redacted criticism, source criticism, all these criticisms were created by looking at the Bible. And we as Christians have have had this done to our scriptures. We now, goodness sakes, this has been going on for almost 200 years. We understand it perfectly because this is part of our old whoop and whoop. I would suggest that it is mostly Christians and Western scholars who are way ahead of everybody else because of the Bible, because we have asked these questions of the Bible. People like Wellhausen in the 1800s, the school in Tübingen in Germany, which came up and started the whole textual critical analysis of the Bible in the late 1800s. That created an entire new study, area of study, that has never, ever been applied to the Quran until right. now. That's and right. that's why it's fascinating. They had used German scholars who were textual criticists, who knew about uh, textual criticism, but also were Arab scholars. These were Arabists who right. had, were, and right. immediately found out and understood what they were looking at. Yeah, and I, and I want to tell our Muslim friends <clears throat> who are probably listening to us right now, really, uh, if you are a serious scholar or someone who is seeking uh, to know more about the Quran, there is nothing damaging about the word textual criticism. Actually, you should embrace that. You should get excited. It's always exciting to study textual criticism of the Bible for one simple reason. <clears throat> it proves the authenticity of the Bible. Because once a book survives all of these critiques, and all of these uh, attacks, that tells you right away that the book is standing on solid foundation, thousands of manuscript evidence and studies, not to mention you know, external studies and so on and so forth. But not so, of course, with our Muslim friends. They always get nervous. They always want to hide uh, you know, information. And immediately they launch attacks the minute you mention anything. Like you know, if, if anybody's tracking our video that we just did recently about this book, right here, you know, which is the 20 example. You know, Jay, uh, the, the answer, I mean, the, the comments we get all the time is always attack without even, you can tell the person didn't even bother to listen to the entire argument yet. <laughs> now we're gonna, we're bouncing all over the place this morning as we get started, uh, but let's go ahead. And uh, it's fascinating. This is a background and this is why it's so good to have Al Fadi on board with us. Al Fadi is going to is will soon be the world's expert on the Sana manuscript. We this pray, brother. We pray. See research. So I'm 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 putting you up there, Al Fadi. You're, I'm sticking you up on no it. pressure, no pressure, no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> You're going to have to live up now to the reputation I'm creating for you. But it's so good, and God bless you that you are willing to to put Thank your you. face in public and you're willing to go public and you're willing to actually take on all the abuse because you get an enormous amount of abuse. Do you not? Absolutely. And, and you know, Jay, I do it because I love my Muslim people. I want them to know the truth. And I'm not here to try to mock them. I'm not here to try to ridicule them. I just want to share the truth with them. I mean, we know at the end of the day, they're smart people. They can think for themselves, but we just need to present the evidence for them. Okay. Now let's start segueing over into what really the, the topic is for today. Thanks for your introduction, Al Fadi. Thanks for coming you're on. Welcome. What we want to do today is we want to go and unpack the the these first two Qurans. And let me just explain what we're talking about. The two first Qurans, this is what Islamic tradition tells us. Islamic tradition is very clear that the Quran, when it was created, the first Quran, uh, did not exist at the time of Muhammad. There was no nothing written down. When I say Quran, I mean written text, uh, this book right here. This is a written text. This is the Quran here. This this part right. of the uh, of the codex. This on this side is nothing more than an English. Well, they we say translation. They won't even call it a translation. It's an interpretation. So here is the Arabic. This Arabic text has gone through a number of changes. Now, how do I know this? I'm just gonna. We're just gonna see what Muslims have told us. What the first Muslims have told us. And these are the earliest Muslims, and the earliest we have reference we have to anything is by Al Buhari. Tell us a little bit about Al Buhari, Al Fadi. Well, Al Buhari, of course, is considered to be the father of Hadith. What is Hadith? These are the sayings of Muhammad. And of course, Hadith collection is the collection of all of what supposedly Muhammad have said during his lifetime. So it took about 240 plus years from the time of Muhammad or the death of Muhammad until the first supposedly collection of hadith emerged by Al-Bukhari. 
Al-Bukhari took it upon himself to go and investigate what did Muhammad say. And he, if my memory serves me right, came up with about 600,000, a collection of 600,000. But he eliminated most of it out of fear and concern that he did not think it was authentic and settled only with 7,000, out of which about uh, 4,000, 7, I believe. 7,397, so yeah. roughly 7,400. Right. Now you're right. Most of them are, are, are most of them was just uh, repetition, repetition. So really, uh, without of unique material, it's just around two thousand hadith that are unique. That's right. And and also another thing that is important. I want you. I love what I love about you. What you're doing is like you hammer out the time. You know, distance. Remember, two hundred and forty years from the time of Muhammad, you have for the first time something called what Muhammad says. I mean, how in the world does that survive accurately? And that's why you have a lot of repetition. Number two, I mean, again, uh, I think uh, a friend of ours is trying to do uh, his PhD on the manuscript of Al-Bukhari, and he couldn't really find an actual manuscript until like the 11th century. So here we go that's again. One of the volumes. That's right. Yeah. So 11th century, Al-Bukhari died, died in... 870 so that's the ninth century so for 200 years we have no manuscript that exists that is extant today that's from the time period of buhari all we have is what was first written in the 11th century that's just one volume there are nine volumes in al buhari those exactly. don't really appear until some say 1600 others are saying it's 1800s so can you see we're not this is even worse than the quran when it comes to what we do know, what we can say, actually, Al Buhari wrote. Yes, exactly, and so so th th that's why these things are damaging. But all that to say, Al Buhari, according to Muslim, they call it Sahih Bukhari. Why? Because it's considered really to be as good as the Quran. If you quote something from Al Bukhari, I doubt any serious Islamic scholar will argue that much with you. Okay, so he is Sahih. He is perfect. He is as good as you're going to get from a human perspective. Yeah. And because of the fact he's so highly respected amongst the Sunnis, we're not talking about the Shiites now, we're Correct. talking about the Sunnis, Correct. which is 90% of the Muslim world. So we're talking about the vast majority of the Muslims. Now, That's correct. what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to screenshot. See, I've not done this before. Let's see if this will work. I'm going to try to screen share an application. And I'm going to look at this. I'm going to put this up and share this with everybody. Can you all see that? Now, Al Fadi, you can see it, can you not, on your screen? I can, and I do have also a copy of it in front of me in case if I need to look at another one. No problem. Let's keep it on. And what I want you to do now, just look at the Arabic there. Tell me, is the Arabic is the Arabic correct? In terms of its translation, you mean? Yeah, the translating on the left. It's translated by Dr. Muhammad Musan Khan. He's the one that's also is the one that translated the Quran that I have in my hand right here. He is the... He is that a good translation? Just look at it real quickly. Uh, just look one or two phrases and see if it's actually a good translation. Absolutely. I actually looked at it uh, this morning right before uh, we connected, and uh, I did not see anything that was alarming to me. Uh, the translation captured everything in the Arabic. Can you just read a little bit of the Arabic to start some of the Arabic there? Okay, so I'm going to start uh, the, the one at uh, the top, uh, uh, number 509. All right, sorry. This is 510. We need to go to 509. Let me go up to 509. Yeah. Let's start with so, 509. So you want me to read in Arabic? It says, حدثنا موسى ابن إسماعيل عن إبراهيم ابن سعد حدثنا ابن شهاب عن عبيد ابن السباق أن زيد ابن ثابت رضي الله عنه قال. So this is the beginning, basically the uh, the isnad or the transmission, basically the narration. Okay. That now, I just read. How do I get back to that? I just lost it again. Uh, you can tell I'm hopeless at this. Let's yeah. look at that again. There it is. Okay. Every time you talk, it, it goes over top of it. So there it is right there. So there I, let's go ahead. Put the English next to it now. So the English of what I read says, narrated Zayd ibn Thabit, Abu Bakr Siddiq sent for me when the people of Yamama had been killed. Now, here is I want to be careful. The English, uh, where it starts, it skips over some of the names that I just mentioned. So the Arabic has the name of the narrators until it gets to this saying in English when Zaid, the collector of the Quran, said the reason why I did it is that the Caliph Abu Bakr sent for me uh, to uh, discuss some serious matters that are happening. 
Okay, so here you have, it's fascinating because here you have, it's an admission that this had not been written down. Yeah, that, that is true. That's what you see here. Why would he send for someone? Why would the caliph send for Zaid and say, Zaid, please help us out. We need to collect the Quran. What's interesting, the reason they need to correct the Quran is because many of those who had memorized it were now dying, had died at the Battle of Yamama, which is from 632, 633. This is after the Prophet's death. So here you have these people who had memorized it were now dying. That, Correct. Wait, wait, what does that tell you? There's a problem here. What's the problem that you can see with that? Well, I mean, uh, we, we can tell, I mean, at least a quick assessment, it wasn't written uh, per se. There was no such thing as a book called the Quran. That's number one. Number two, there's specific people that memorize that. Here's what I mean by that. Wouldn't you think that Umar and Abu Bakr, the closest companions to the Prophet, would have been one of those people who memorized the whole Quran and didn't need to be panicky that, like this? Uh, apparently, they didn't memorize the whole Quran. Maybe they memorized portions of it, but it appears that there is a uh, a core, you know, of people whose specialty was to memorize the Quran and not necessarily all the Quran. We're saying you have a group of people, if you put them all together, supposedly, you will come up with something called the Quran. So they are being killed or dying in a battle of Ali Amama right now. And then you have someone who supposedly, Zayd ibn Thabit, the one that they reached out to, was a scribe for Muhammad, but yet he himself also didn't have the whole Quran. I mean, how can you be a scribe for the prophet, writing down what he says, and still don't have the full Quran? Okay. And these are just some of the things that I'm seeing so far. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Now, let's go one step further. If you have a text, now, obviously, they don't have a text. It's not written down. And the answer that always we get from Muslims today is, so what? We don't need a text. It was memorized. However, you can see immediately here that this was a huge problem because we know that only 70, according to the traditions, according to Al-Bahari, only 70. It's not in this paper. It's in another one. It's in uh, uh, volume four. Only 70 had were those who had died at the Battle of Yamama, which means the vast majority of those who had memorized it had died. That's what caused the crisis. That's right. This is a crisis situation. That's why Abu Bakr and Umar have brought Zaid ibn Thabit, who is the secretary of Muhammad, to the court to talk to him. Can you see the difficulty? This idea that we don't have to worry about it written down, it was memorized. Hold on a minute. Those who had memorized it were almost all dead. And that's why you have to write it down. Can you see? You cannot, leave, you cannot depend on memorization. This idea that people memorize it today is superfluous since today I don't even know what they memorize. That's what we're going to get to later on. But can you see? And from the very beginning, they realized they had to have this written down because that, memorization was not good enough. The reason is very clear. If those who had memorized it or died, died, then the Quran's dead. There is no Quran left. They realized that from the very beginning, you had to have it written down. That's why they had Zaid ibn Tabit come before them. That's right. And, and of course, uh, you know, not only that, but the way Zaid even collected the Quran, he had to chase not only people, but he has to find also leaf stalks. He has to find okay. white stone. Now you're jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead. But let's let's get to that. Continue reading down. What happens next? What does he say when they when they ask him to do this? Look at his response. Yeah. So I'm going back again. And he says, uh, so in, uh, he says, uh, a number of the prophet's companions who fought against Musaylimah, that's a, a supposedly a false prophet, uh, I went to him and found Umar ibn al-Khattab sitting with him. So Abu Bakr then said to me, meaning to Zaid, Umar has come to me and said, casualties were heavy among the Qur'a, meaning the readers of the Quran, i.e. those who knew the Quran by heart on the day of the battle of Yamama, and I am afraid, notice, I am afraid that more heavy casualties may take place among the Quran on other battlefields whereby a large part of the Quran may be lost. So okay. it's obvious to me, from what uh, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar are saying here, it's obvious to me that they were concerned that the Quran would get lost if it didn't get written down. That's correct. 
So this idea, this Muslims just read your own tradition. It's your own tradition that accuses you and pretty much supports the fact that they realize that memorization wasn't good enough. Why? Because those who memorized the Quran would die, especially in battle. Once they're dead, there's no Quran. You've got to get it written down. Okay, let's continue on. And so after he said that, uh, therefore, so the reason now why they're calling him, I suggest you order that the Quran be collected. So Omar telling Abu Bakr this. So Abu Bakr says, I said to Omar, how can we, how can you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? So Omar says, by Allah, that is a good project. So now here Zaid is actually the scribe of the Muhammad is really having a problem with the idea of writing the Quran since he said the prophet didn't order something like this. So he actually, it's Zaid ibn Thabi having a conversation with Umar. And Zaid is saying, how can you do something the prophet, my prophet didn't even do? So that's proof that he had not written it down. That When Muslims go on and on and on by the fact it had been written down by the, before that uh, Muhammad's death, this is uh, virtual proof. Here's Zaid ibn Thabi saying, no, it didn't happen. You're telling me to do something that my prophet didn't even do. And then right. Umar said, it's still a good thing. It's a good project. That's right. And and, oh. he, he, and then Zaid continued to say, Omar kept on urging me. So that, that tells you that Zaid wasn't even buying it yet. Not yet, until Allah opened his chest. Continue on. So he says, uh, uh, Omar kept on urging me to accept this proposal till Allah opened my chest for it. And I began to realize the good in the idea which Omar had realized. Then Abu Bakr said to me, you are a wise young man and we do not have any suspicion about you and you used to write the divine inspiration for allah's apostle so you should search for the fragmentary scribe uh, scripts uh, of the quran and collected in one book okay so you are going to do what muhammad had not done you're going to go and search now look and see where he gets his material from. Before I, I do this, one quick comment. Why in the world would they uh, uh, choose someone who is young when they had people who are more mature and more advanced in their writings and things like that, like Obayi bin Kaab and Abdullah bin Masoud? That's something maybe we'll talk about later. Come back so, to that. Let's continue with this right now. So here is what he says. So by Allah, if they had ordered me to shift one of the mountains, it wouldn't have been heavier for me than this ordering me to collect the Quran. Then I said to Abu Bakr, how will you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? Once again, he's repeating the same thing because he is just concerned about this project. So Abu Bakr replied, by Allah, it is a good project. So Abu Bakr kept on urging me, now Abu Bakr is urging him, to accept his idea until Allah opened my chest for what he had opened the chest of Abu Bakr and Omar. Now we get to how he collected it. So I started looking for the Quran and collecting it from what was written on palm leaf stalks, thin white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart. I'm going to stop right okay, here. Right there. That's hugely important. Now we're putting it on the screen. Are you people watching this? Looking and look and see what's going on here. So you might want to enlarge it uh, if you can, uh, because it's a little uh, small in the screen, just for people if they if they can see it. Now, is that larger? Can you see that now? Yes, that's large enough. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Let's come down to where we are. So we're looking at, this is fascinating because this means it's not just the memorized text. He is also has to go to stones, stocks, and bones. Actually, bones is missing in this text. In the other one of Abu of, 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 of Buhari, it also has scapula, which means bones. So he is getting from his, it was written on other pieces or other objects. That's besides right. The, uh, the, besides just the memory of men, it was also written on other objects. Correct. Which, let me just be the devil's advocate here. What if some of the people who died in this battle had written something on some objects and nobody knows where they kept it now? Or they had memorized portions that no one else had memorized. That's right. And that is no longer there. That's right. 
This is hugely important because when we get to John of Damascus, uh, and if you look at Daniel Janasik's doctoral thesis, he talks about this very thing because John of Damascus is having debates with Muslims about the surah of the camel. There is no surah of the camel in the Quran. A whole, a complete surah is, that he was debating with Muslims about, and they were responding to it, supporting it, and actually using it in their defense didn't, doesn't even exist in the Quran. So it's obvious that there was other material that existed that no longer is in the Quran just from looking at the historical context. But can, nonetheless, can you see everything that we are now coming to? This is proof that the Quran we have today is not from Muhammad. It's not from Uthman, sorry, uh, uh, Umar, or from Abu Bakr. It is from Zaid ibn Thabit. Right, and, and it's, um, you know, Jay, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking a seat back now and, and comparing this to what we have in the Bible, the importance of eyewitness accounts and writing things down uh, from day one, you know, from immediately, and plus the manuscript evidence, of course, that supports it. But here you can tell that the the process at the beginning was loosey doosey I mean, no, no one were really collecting anything per se, as a book or a codex. And now you have one person have to chase it all and find it. And there was no Google at that time, okay? He couldn't Google it and find it, whatever it was. Can I just, before, before we go on, I, I've been watching the, the chats that they've been going, and I agree with Bart Connolly. Thanks, Bart, for saying that. People, you're, you're discussing things that, are, that we're not talking about. Those discussions you can do at other times. Try to keep your discussion in the chat group to what we're bringing up here. Because we really want to zero in on these early manuscripts. We want to zero in on this first Quran. If you could keep your discussion to that, that would help out an awful lot. Thank you. Let's get back to this again. Now, so we have here the first recension. You have now the first copy of the Quran that has been tabulated and has been really tabulated from a number of different sources, from people's memories, from bones, from stones, from palm leaves. And then he realizes that there is one part of the Quran that's missing. The flat last verse of Surah al taba which is actually Surah 9, Ayah 128 and 129. It's two verses in the back that, that right at the end of Surah 9. What is, what is he, what are you, just read that there. So he's there, uh, he said, you know, then, uh, and I did not find, uh, so after he collected it from the heart of man, till I found the last verse of Surat Al-Tawbah, Repentance, which is chapter 9, with Abi Khuzaimah Al-Ansari, and I did not find it with anybody other than him. Now here is, may, may I comment on this, uh, Jay, why he said that? Yeah. The reason why he said I did not find it with anyone or anybody other than him, because uh, in other traditions, when you read it, Zaid was also asking for people to have two witnesses with them to prove that they have heard it. And in this case, it was the last verse, and somehow this person that has it, memorized it, couldn't bring another witness with him to say, okay, so I heard it and this guy heard it, so it's two of us. It's kind of interesting because this verse, of course, he reads it. It's chapter 9, verses 128 and 129. Look the excuse that he came up with why he still accepted it, even though there was no second eyewitness. He said, then the complete manuscript copy of the Quran remained with Abu Bakr. So here it didn't say it, but in another tradition it says that he remembered that the prophet said the testimony of this guy equals two. And that's why he accepted it. <laughs> so you can see obviously it could have been that he there have been many, probably many other testimonies that were not included uh abbas aga uh, has written jay and al fadi you are simply making a mountain out of a molehill it will never interest sincere minded people well i see 114 people are watching this show right now it certainly is interesting at least over 100 that are watching it live there will be many thousands that will hear this later on but here i want to ask you abbas uh, how, what is the mountain that we're making? Why is it you think we're making a mountain out of molehill? We're asking actually very legitimate questions. And here are the questions I want of us to answer. Since he thinks we're just making a mountain out of this, I want him to come back and tell us, first and foremost, why in the world was this not written down during Muhammad's lifetime? Number one, what was Muhammad's 
really, what was his ministry? What was his mission? He really had really only one mission as a prophet to receive this revelation and then to give it to the world. So in why in the world? He had 22 years to do this. Am I correct, al Fadi? Yes, of course. 22 years he had to give this. Now, Muslims will come back to me and they'll say he would, could not read or write. That's why he did not write it down. He was illiterate. The difficulty I have with that is who cares whether he began illiterate? He knew Arabic. It doesn't take long to read and write Arabic. There are only 28 letters. I learned to read and write Arabic in two weeks back in 1994. I didn't know Arabic, but I could still learn to read and write it. I didn't know what I was writing. I didn't know what I was reading. But Muhammad did. Muhammad could understand what he was reading. He could understand what he was writing. He had 22 years to learn that alphabet. He had 22 years to then to use it. He had 22 years then to take that which was he was receiving and to get, read, have it written down. However, let's go one step further. Who did he have at his disposal to write it down if he didn't want to write it? Do you know the answer, Al Fadi? Well, he had his own scribes to write it. And what's yeah. the name of the scribe we're talking about? Who do you think this whole story is going to? It's Zaid ibn Thabit. What do you think Zaid ibn Thabit was? Yeah, he, he admitted that he was a scribe. He was a or secretary of Muhammad. What do secretaries do? <laughs> <laughs> write things, you know, among many other things. And obviously he didn't do a good job, or at least it's an admission that he wasn't writing everything. And you see, to me, this is fascinating. That 22 years, he could have either written it down or he could have had Zaid ibn Thabit write it down. In 22 years, he didn't do either. Spending much of his time, as we now know, taking care of his wives and really establishing a Khilafat. And that's why so much of his time, once he moved to Medina, became just that, which is unfortunate. Because by doing that, he didn't he, he missed out on the vote, the most important part of his whole ministry, which was it, which is to write this book down. Let's then go to this. Um, this I mean, book. let me let me uh, make, make a quick comment, by the way, an, an observation, I should say. Um, you know, uh, Jay, if if you would have a Quran uh, like today's Quran, for instance, that supposedly supposedly have more than six thousand two hundred plus verses, you know, depending who you ask, and at the same time, you know, has at least one hundred and fourteen chapters, which we know Obai has different number, one hundred sixteen. Uh, you know, uh, Abdullah bin Masoud has a different number, and people are writing it. People now at the community of Muhammad writing it on bones and writing it on, you know palm leaves and things like that wouldn't you think that you would at least come across traditions that says when people used to travel they would have a mule or two to carry their quran with them because there was a lot of stones and things like that <laughs> okay actually what's fascinating let's continue on with what at the very last paragraph of the of this reading the uh, 509 read with the very last paragraph and let's pick up your question from there so the last paragraph says, then the complete manuscripts copy of the Quran remained with Abu Bakr till he died, then with Omar till the end of his life, and then with Hafsa, the daughter of Omar. And what did Hafsa do with it? Oh, she just saved it, man. That's all she did. She put it under her bed and left. That's right. Now, why in the world would you labor to do all of this for the sake of just having a copy put on your shelf and do nothing with it? <laughs> Can you see for me, this is actually, I'm gobsmacked when I came to this last paragraph. If this is the greatest revelation in the history of mankind, if this is the final revelation that's supposed to correct everything that's come before, you write one copy, right? You have Zaid ibn Tabi go and collect it from stones, bones, palm sleeves, and also from the memory of others. You give it first to Abu Bakr, who then gives it to Umar, who then gives it to Hafsa. She puts it under her bed, which means you make no copies of it. You make nothing to give to anybody else. You keep it for yourself, and you leave it there for 20 years. 20 so, years. 
Absolutely. So let, let's think about it for a second. Obviously, I mean, we are going to talk at some point, maybe today or next time, about the second effort to collect, which is everybody knows of the name Uthman. But let's let's lay Uthman aside. Abu Bakr didn't know Uthman was going to do something like this. We don't have any tradition that says someone charged Uthman to do something like this in the future. Omar didn't know that something like this was going to happen. So it's very clear that they had no problem keeping the memorization problem to continue, but they just wanted a copy just in case to be aside in case we go back and check it. So can you imagine what would have happened today if that's the only copy of the Quran? It would have been lost probably by now. Okay, but we do know that that is the only copy. Are, am I correct? I mean, based on the tradition, of course, that's the only supposedly copy of the Quran that emerged for the first time. So this is the only copy that existed. Am I correct? In yes. 634. Of course, because we know that Zaid never said, I went and I consulted with so-and-so, can I borrow your copy? No, he went Let's to collect it. Let's go to the next section. Let's go to the next page. Because yeah. now we go to 20 years later. I'm putting it on the screen. Can you see it there? Yes. And okay. uh, I'm going to go ahead now and uh, get my copy to read it. So the next one, which is 510, Hadith number 510. So everybody now we jump 20 years. Let me just for those who are listening. 509 is 632 to 634. Now we're going to 510. Now we're 20 years later where Abu Bakr has died. Umar has been killed. He was killed in 646. Uthman comes to power in 646. He rules for 10 years up till 656. He is then killed. But now we're halfway through his reign in six, around 652. So roughly 20 years after the first copy was created by Zaid ibn Thabit, given to Abu Bakr, who then gave it to Umar, who then gave it to his daughter Hafsa, the wife of Muhammad, one of the 12 wives of Muhammad. She left it under her bed. We are now 20 years later. Let's pick up the story. So the story goes like this. Narrated Anas ibn Malik. By the way, this is the guy who founded the Maliki school of Sharia. So uh, narrated Anas ibn Malik, uh, uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman came to Uthman at the time when the people of Sham, Levant basically, and the people of Iraq were waging war to conquer Armenia and Adar. Okay. And he says, uh, Adrabijan, I'm sorry. Um, Hudayfa was afraid of their differences, which there mean in reference to the people of Sham, Iraq and Syria, modern day Syria. Differences in a recitation of the Quran. So he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book, meaning the Quran, as Jews and the Christians did before. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa. Who's Hafsa? The one that kept that copy. Saying, send us the manuscripts of the Quran so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. Maybe I'll stop right here in case you have any comments. Well, listen, we're getting lots of questions. We've got to deal with the questions. My technician in England is saying, please, 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 you're going too fast. You're getting too much material. Can we go back to 509 and deal with those questions first? So, Absolutely. I, I think it's a good idea. Absolutely. I understand that. So let's go and let me just read some of the questions to you, Al-Fadi, and then you answer them. Uh, here's the first one. Why did, didn't did Allah teach Muhammad how to read and write? If he had 20 years to do so, if Allah is that great and that powerful and Allah is omnipotent, then why in the world did he not teach Muhammad how to read and write? What's your answer to that? Uh, my answer is it's an excellent question. And here's why this is significant. You look in the Bible, for instance, and you see a barren woman given a birth. That's a sign from God. You see a paralyzed man standing and walking. That's a sign to prove that God has done a miraculous thing through either Jesus or through someone, an apostle or a prophet. Wouldn't it have been perfect for Muhammad to come and tell people, hey, I, I know how to read and write right now. Oh, how can you, Muhammad? You've been illiterate for 40 plus years and all of a sudden you can read and write. Obviously, God <laughs> didn't even exist. This is just a figment of somebody's imagination, but I agree with you. He could have taught him. 
but it appears that that's not the case. Okay, and here's another question. This is even better. I like this question. This is one I've always asked, and that is why in the world did God, did Allah, choose an illiterate man to give his greatest revelation? And secondly, why in the, wis of the wisdom of God, why did he use a language that could not even accommodate the text that he was sending down? In other words, it had no diacritical marks. It had no vowelization that early. That was only invented in the 8th and ninth century. That's why nobody could read these earliest Qurans. That's why even the Arabs today can't read them. They have to have people like the Germans come down and read them. So can you answer those two questions, Al-Fadi? Why would God, in his wisdom, he already had Arabic. He, I'm sorry, he already had Hebrew and Greek. Why would then he do use a completely new language? And secondly, why would he choose a man who couldn't read and write for his greatest revelation? Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, this is another proof that the God that Muhammad is serving wasn't the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations. And when Jesus came into the scene, by the way, we have the Septuagint, which, by the way, the number 70 that you mentioned about the collectors of the Hafaz of the Quran was kind of funny because it's almost like he copied the LXX, the Septuagint, the number 70 in there. But nevertheless, the Hebrew Bible was already translated into Greek. Also, you think they have just taken this number from oh, absolutely Septuagint. absolutely okay. he's fascinated by these things in fact when you read about how many people tra uh, migrated from mecca to medina the number 70 will pop up again just like the story when the hebrew people migrated basically uh from egypt so nevertheless uh, iran borrowed most of its materials so did those who put the tradition together borrowed most of their material from other sources that is correct. So uh, you're absolutely right. So why would God not, in his wisdom, prepare the people and their heart in the area, not just in Arabia, outside of Arabia, to understand Arabic, to have the writing of Arabic in a way that is easily understood and so on and so forth, compared to, for instance, to the biblical times where everybody was ready already to accept the Greek because it was the common language. Even though we know people spoke Aramaic, we know they probably spoke something else, but everybody... The majority of people, if not all of them, in that region understood the Greek. That's why the Bible spread so fast. People were ready to understand it, to comprehend it. And you're right. Uh, you know, why would you send it in a language that only a handful of people understood? Not only that, uh, Jay, I would argue only a handful understood the dialect of Muhammad, actually. Not just all Arabs spoke that dialect. Okay, so brilliant answer. Let's go on to another question. Why, and this comes back, this is from Bart Connolly. He said, about 42 scribes wrote the verses on different materials such as paper, cloth, bone, fragments, and leather, etc. So his first question, who were they according to Islamic tradition? Who were these people? How does it where suddenly we're trusting them? And why is it that Zaid ibn Thabit trusted these? We don't know who these people were. They were not prophets. They were nothing more than, than what? How would you answer that? I mean, uh, the, supposedly they were people that were familiar with the Quran, or it's either that or Zaid kept asking everybody, do you know anything? What do you know? Tell me about it. And he would compare to what he has already collected. Either way, it's kind of interesting because after the death of Muhammad, you start hearing names of people that were not prominent during his days. I mean, you would have expected Abu Bakr, you would expect Uthman, Omar, those are prominent people. Ali, for instance, but you don't hear about them. You hear about names of people that nobody knew. In fact, that's why uh, Obai, uh, I should say, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was arguing about why would you use Zaid versus using me? I was the guy who knew most of the Quran and wrote even my own codex. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is um, Ubay ibn Kaab and Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Musa. And then Zaid ibn Tabi, these are the four that wrote the, what we know as the four metropolitan codices. And uh, Dr. Arthur Jeffrey has looked at just those four codices. Uh, look at the Islamic tradition has come up with 15,000 differences between those four codices. That's codices. right. It's called yeah. The Materials of the Quran, by the way. That's the book that uh, Jay is referring to, The Materials of the Quran by Arthur Jeffrey. Arthur Jeffrey, who, who is an Australian and he died in the 1930s, was way ahead of his time. Uh, and this segues into the next question, and that is, why have so few scholars critically analyzed the Islamic sources? Why is it people like Arthur Jeffrey and Goldecker, Goldzieher and Noldecker and uh, Schacht, these are all German names, and of course, uh, uh, the, the Australian, these are all Westerners who have done all this German work. We don't see one 
Arab name amongst these great scholars of the earliest text. What do you think is the reason for that, al -Thadi? Well, I mean, uh, Jay, you and I know that today we have some Arab, uh, you know, scholars who are starting to look into it, but you have the issue of, of fear and concern. Your life is threatened all the time. You receive death threats. You are being marginalized or attacked by governments, by authorities, by people. So who in the right mind wants to put themselves out there and cause themselves harm? And that's the problem. Unfortunately, of course, back then that was the case. Today, not so, because now we have social media. We have so many outlets and platforms where people can see now and research. And it's hard for anyone to hide the facts anymore. Okay, and this is one reason why what we're doing right now, Hangouts on Google Chrome, uh, could not be done. In, I don't know of any Arab equivalent, and this, no one would ever do this. So you're saying it's not healthy uh, for people to ask these kind of questions? Unfortunately, it's still uh, not healthy in certain areas or in certain environments, but that doesn't mean it's not accessible anymore. Al -Fadi, of can you go home to Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Unless if you want me dead. <laughs> so you're a case in point. This is very personal for you. You are not even able to go home and visit your parents. And visit that is correct. That is correct. That, which is a sad thing, really, if you think about it. I hope people are listening to this. This kind of research, the fact that Al-Fadi is willing to put his face uh, on uh, public, the fact that we're looking at him today, it means he cannot even go home to Saudi Arabia. This is... This is one of probably the only area of research that I know where what you research can kill you. That's correct. And, and you know, people can just do a simple Google search of certain open-minded Islamic scholars who dared to speak against the Quran and see what happened to them. Well, you know, Al-Fadi, it just makes us all the more grateful that you are around and grateful that you're willing to go public and grateful that you're willing to come and help us out with this material because this is really your background you used to be a muslim this used to be your text you were a salafi muslim you are one of the most radical of muslims you you so you have come from there and now have come this direction you have come home to jesus christ but now Amen. you realize that this kind of work needs to be done and it needs to be done by experts like you because you can read the language, you can understand it, you can exegete it, you know the grammar of it, you can, you know, it's Quranic Arabic. There are very few people that have the caliber of understanding of Arabic like you do. And, and I appreciate you, Jay, and I really appreciate Dr. Brubaker, for instance. I appreciate the uh, Hurt Poen and Elizabeth Poen and Asma Hilali and all of those scholars that are really putting their name out there. They're dabbling with things that they know is risky. So I'm so thankful, of course, for, for those who pioneered you know, the process for people like myself. That's right. Now, we know of two or three other scholars that are doing similar work to you, but we not, are not permitted to give their names because they would, not, they would not be able to get into the areas they need to get into, which to me is absolutely mind-boggling. There's no other area of research where we have to even have this kind of discussion except when it comes to the Quran and when it comes to Muhammad. Uh, the uh, researching the historicity of Muhammad, and I hope you Muslims are listening to this. We're you're in some ways this is this is this is your problem. The you Muslims uh, have got to deal with this. You're the only ones that can stop this censorship. That can stop this voracious hatred of anybody that is critical of your book or your man. Which we are critical, but we are not hateful. And this idea of us being hate mongers and Islamophobes because we're asking these questions. Have you noticed everything we've done on the show today? We've gone now an hour, almost an hour. Anybody can say, anybody can do. This is not a Christian polemic. This is a historical polemic. And it's the most neutral of polemics. I hope you're all listening to this. I hope you're all understanding this. Now, Al Fadi, we do want to get back to this material again. I have some more questions from. Um, Bart, uh, sorry, Bart Connie. Bart, thank you so much for sending ahead. You actually put some questions ahead uh, of the the show today. So I'm going to just read them off to you, Al Fadi, and have you answer them. These questions. He has about five or six. Uh, this is his first one here. He says that. Um, well, he talked about the ones about the the 42. Number two. During the time of Caliph Abu Bakr, well, about 70 people who knew the Quran by heart were killed in the Battle of Yamama. Umar ibn al-Khattab began, 
became concerned and appealed to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr formed a delegation under the leadership of Zaid ibn Thabit, one of the leading scribes. This delegation now, Bart says it's 12 people. I understand there was four, that Allah Zubair and uh, Hisham, that's in 6510, including famous figures like Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Al, uh, Abi Talib, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, Abdullah ibn Masood, Ubay ibn Kaab, Khalid. Okay, these are the other ones that wrote the other Qurans. These are the names I'm familiar with. And that uh, that came together in Umar's house and collected all the material on which verses from the Quran were written. There were 6,233 verses, 236 verses, 114 surahs, and about 323,000 letters in the Quran. Bart, I'm not sure if this is the first recension or you're talking about the second recension. I think you're referring to the second recension, which we haven't got to yet. Now, here's this question. Why is it that there was needed? Why did they need to change the... Okay. I see. These are all questions from what we have yet to uncover. So let's go ahead and uncover, and we'll come back to Mark's questions now. Let's go. Let's come down to uh, chapter six, five, ten. I'm going to share this so you can read it, and if you could go quickly to it, uh, this right here. Can you see it now? Yes. Go ahead. Read that five, ten. What are we hearing here? So uh, this is the second tradition about the second compilation by Uthman. It says, narrated, Anas ibn Malik, uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman came to Uthman at the time when the people of Sham and the people of Iraq were waging war to conquer Armenia and Azerbaijan. So Hudayfa was afraid. Once again, we have somebody who's afraid, afraid of their uh, basically differences, meaning the Muslims having differences in dialects or in recitation of the Quran. So he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book, in reference to the Quran, of course, as Jews and the Christians did before. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscripts of the Quran so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. Hafsa sent it to Uthman. Uthman then ordered Zaid ibn Thabit. Here we go. Once again, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Sa'id uh, uh, Sa ibn Al-As, and Abdul Rahman ibn Al-Harith uh, ibn Hisham to rewrite the manuscripts in perfect copies. Uthman said to the three Qurayshi men, in case you disagree with Zaid ibn Thabit, I thought that was funny, really, when I read it, uh, uh, you know, and every time I read it. He said, in case you disagree with Zaid ibn Thabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh as the Quran was revealed in their tongue. You want me to keep going or stop? No, let's stop there. You've said an awful lot. All right, so let's give some background here, al Fadi. If this is now 20 years later, we're now with Uthman 652, not 632 anymore. And then we're now moving into this part. Uh, Uthman has asked Zaidi bin Tawid, along with these others, Zubair, Alas, and Hisham, the four of them, to get this copy from Hafsa. So this is the copy that she kept under her bed, right? That's right. And the reason why, can you see there what he says? What is the reason why they're asking for this copy? Uh, they're asking to rewrite, it says. They're not asking to make copies of it. It's kind of interesting, really. I mean, you would think they said, hey, give us, please, the copy so we can make more copies of it and settle this difference. No, he says, let's rewrite it. That's but the first up, problem. Look, look, let me read this again. It's even worse than that. Hudaifa was afraid of their differences in the recitation of the Quran. That's right. Recitation means that you're reading it, not writing it, not in the writing of the Quran, in the recitation. Now, help us here. As an Arab, as an Arabist, as an Arab speaker, fluent Arab speaker, when you recite, when you read something, the, the reading, the, the way you read it, you put different dialectic, you put different dialectic pronunciations depending on what part of the Arab world you come from. Am I correct? 
That is correct. That is correct. And uh, you know, when you uh, like, for instance, uh, if you want to shift the the, uh, the the image on the screen right now, share just to the Arabic, so you can point out to people what we're talking about. You can point these diacritical markings, you know, there for them. So if you can see, guys, uh, these these are letters, but okay. you see like a, a dash underneath something, dash above. You ha you have a little circle called sukun and and so many other things. Without though, not to mention dots. You see okay. dots. One dot, two dots, you know. Stop you there, Al Fadi. Unfortunately, with um, Hangouts, you can only show one screen at a time. So when you're talking, they can't see the writing. Now, when I talk, all they can see is the writing. So look at what Al Fadi is saying. Look at what we've shown you. There's the Arabic. Can you see the dots above and below? Can you see if I could make it here? See where my cursor is going? Oh, sorry. I need to learn how to do this. I haven't found out how I can actually uh, make a, uh, a shot. Can you see where I'm? Uh, the circle that is a dhamma there. Here is a fata. Down below are the is a kasra. Those are the vowelizations. The dots then are the ones that get that delineate the different razam, the different consonants. But that did not exist in the seventh century. None of that was there in the seventh century. That is in a modern day Quran. Okay, so that's why it's fascinating. If you're talking about recitation, you need those dhamma, the kasra, and the fatta. You need those vowelizations there. You need also the diacritical marks, the dots above and below the letters there, in order to read the text, in order to rec recite the text. Recitation requires diacritical marks and vowelization. Am I correct, Al Fadi? That is correct, but but Jay, I thought the Quran was written, right? You know, but apparently uh, here, people who are just memorizing it, they were memorizing it in different dialects. So I'm confused here. <laughs> so it, they are. There probably were different dialects, but there's nothing that would change the written text for those dialects. That's yep. why even today, if you go to an Arab. A bookshop or a newspaper shop uh, and you get an Arab newspaper in London there would be Arab shops in the Arab quarter and we would find a newspaper that was published in Egypt they would not have the vowelization on them that's and right they, uh, and the reason why is because they wanted people from Morocco and Jordan and Yemen to be able to buy their newspaper and to be able to read the consonantal text they would put their own vowels on depending on their own dialect even today in the 21st century, you keep the vowels off so that everybody can read the same text, but they would put their own readings on, on that text that is written. So what is this notion that they are scared that they would recite it different? Right? Let's go back to the English here. Can you see? Differences in the recitation of the recitation of the Quran. There is no recitation differences in a consonantal text. Yeah, I mean, let, let's just look at the English, uh, uh, obviously, uh, where it says Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Way at the top, uh, you know, if you can show him that, uh, Jay, where it says yeah, narrated Anas it. ibn Malik, right? Narrated Anas ibn Malik. Okay, let's I'm use the now so they can see it. Narrated yeah. Anas ibn Malik Hudayfa ibn Yaman, al -Yaman okay. came to Uthman. So here right. is somebody who has a problem. Let's look at the name Malik right there. If I change the diacritical markings, the meaning can change. Malik, for instance, which, by the way, is found in chapter one of the Quran. Malik is someone who possesses thing. If I say Malik, because I change the position of the diacritical, Malik, uh, 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 diacritical markings, he becomes, the, it means king versus someone who possesses. Notice, it's the same resum, the same, you know, letters next to each other. By changing the way I pronounce it or recite it, the meaning of the word change immediately. So this is just a, a, a tiny bit of example. By the way, I saw behind you, by the way, Jay, the book that I contributed to, The Quran Dilemma. In there, we have an entire page with a table where we used one resum and we came up with almost 33 different ways of using that resum to come up with 33 different forms and meanings. What page is it? I've got here is the Quran. Here, let me just uh, stop the share here and then uh, hold on a minute. I'll be right back with you. There, I'm back to me again. Oh, hold on a minute. Cancel. Now, can you see me? Here is the book he's talking about, The Chronic Dilemma. Al Fadi was one of those who contributed to this. Do you remember the page number on that? I don't, but it will be under the variant text readings. There is two articles that we wrote in there at the beginning. So, um... Near the uh, 
it will be uh, y yes i mean uh, it will be like probably within the first 100 pages or so okay i'm looking you keep talking while i keep but, but nevertheless uh, the idea is this uh, when you take a word in Arabic and you start changing the position of the dots or the position of the diacritical markings, you come up with a different pronunciation, but also a different meaning of that word. And this is why we have early manuscripts of the Quran that have those variants in them. And when you compare it to today's Quran, you immediately realize that the word was being read differently and also the meaning of the word would have been different as well. And this is, by the way, where, you know, as you know, Jay, people come to the rescue and they say, well, it was like revealed in seven Ahruf. If that's the case, then why did Uthman decide on one? Yep, there you go. That's it. That's the okay, table. Look right there. here. There's, this is what he's talking about. I'll put it up as close as I can. If, uh, now, I'm going to put it up there, but as soon as you talk, that will go. Let the people see it first. Folks, this is one word. Notice has how many variations? Just one word by changing the location of the dots and the okay. diacritical markings. Let people look at it. So there is one word. If you, Depending on where you put the dots on it, look at how many different renditions you have. So that's there. That's on page 103. Get this book. Put it in your library so you can see what... Uh, how, what how by the way, they, they can only buy the... Uh, ebook which is the articles that has this which is available on amazon as well you can only buy the the, the ebook is right now if they don't want the whole thing yeah they can buy the ebook oh, which I see. Is the you, article. Can, you can also do the ebook which is a lot cheaper you're correct now right. so getting back to what we're reading here let's go back to this screen share again so we can refer to this and let's go back to this again here you have hudaifa i'm sorry you have Hudayfa bin al Yaman. He's coming to Uthman, 652, and he says we have. He's afraid that there are going to be re differences in the recitation of the Quran, which makes no sense in the seventh century, but makes all kinds of sense in the ninth century. And right. remember, this is being written at the time of Abu Al Bukhari, who died in 870. You can see for Al Bukhari, this would make sense because at that time, Damakasr and Fatah were all used quite well by the ninth right. century they were well established so this is a ninth century argument that's been redacted back to the seventh century a huge error by al buhari right i mean uh, that's this is the story of the scholarship of early islam anyway so okay now let's continue on so this is what he so he has these four guys to come and he has them i'm just rolling scrolling down as you can see it there on the screen i'm scrolling down there you see al zubair al as and Harith and Hisham, Ibn Hisham, they are now helping Zaid ibn Tabi to rewrite the Quran. If it was already complete, it was already in, uh, without any error, why would you need to rewrite it if it's only to do with, in this case, uh, recitation? And you see that's a problem in and of itself. Why Absolutely. Why just take Hafsa's copy and just mass produce it? And, and no, Jay, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure you paid attention to this, but I want uh, our, you know, uh, uh, viewers right now and listeners to pay attention. Look what he says. He says, rewrite the manuscripts in perfect copies. So apparently he wasn't still convinced that they have a perfect copy. And number two, he asked Hafsa to give him the manuscripts. He didn't say give us the codex. He didn't say give us the book. So they were still in loose manuscripts. <laughs> obviously give us the script so that's fascinating in and of itself now you they say in case you disagree with Zaid ibn Tabi that's the other three on any point then write it in the dialect of the Qureshi how can you write it in the dialect of the Qureshi unless you have vowelization to write it in the dialect of the Qureshi only in that, the ninth century would that make sense that is correct and the other thing also that is damaging here we just made the case that Zayd ibn Thabit was one of the scribes of Muhammad and the others, we didn't hear their names to be one of his scribes. And this guy was already commissioned the first time by Abu Bakr and Omar. Why would you disagree with his writing and overwrite it? <laughs> so it's obviously that there were problems with the first Quran. That's the problem, number one. It had to be rewritten again. 
Now, many Muslims will come back on us, and I'm sure I'm, I'm not. I'm looking. I don't see any Muslim who has come back on us with this point. I'm surprised because almost every Muslim I know will always say, "This is what to do with Ahruf and Kirat, and it has really? to do with Azerbaijan." In Azerbaijan, they read it a different way. They recited it a different way, and that's why they were fearful that the recitation coming from Azerbaijan would become the classical or the 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 narrative for all of the Qurans. So in well, some ways, you can see that there's already a hierarchy hierarchy of recitations, of uh, dialectical differences. Well, any argument like you just mentioned right now, I would say it's a poor argument by our Muslim friends because right here in this uh, tradition that we're reading, look what uh, Uthman says. He says, in case you disagree with Zayd ibn Thabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in a dialect of Quraysh as the Quran was revealed in their tongue, the tongue of Quraysh. One harf, not seven. <laughs> so obviously, all they needed to do was recopy Hafsa's copy. Am I correct? That's right. Exactly. But they didn't have copy machines, but that's all that they would really are we required to do. Why in the world did they just copy Hafsa's copy that was already in the Qureshi dialect and of course as we keep reminding the, the the listeners dialectical difference require vowelization and diacritical marks did not exist in the seventh century that's why Arabs cannot read the Sana'a manuscript they had to bring down the Germans to read it because they that's impossible to read it without the vowelization now let's move on because I mean it just it's just mouth-watering some of the things that come up next so, so he has them do this yeah, and it says they did so, and when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied okay, and okay, ordered. Right and, and here I want you really to comment because I love the way you analyze this one. <laughs> So what we know, this happened about a number of years ago. I was on the ladder with Hatun and Mansur Ahmed, who confronted me over a month ago uh, concerning Daniel Brubaker's 2022 20, corrections. He was confronting us with this very thing, and he was clear that there were four copies that were made. Uh, and he was, and this is what I've always been taught that there were four copies. And most of you who have been studied. Islam in university. This is what everybody says. I, all, the, all the readings that I had done, it's always the four copies were sent to four cities, and the four cities were Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, and uh, Dam Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, and uh, Mecca. So, or Medina, sorry, Medina. So those are the four: Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, and Medina. And those are the where the four metropolitan codices come from. Arthur Jeffrey referred to these four metropolitan codices. And Ubay Ibn Qab's codex that became very popular in Damascus. Ibn Masud's codex that became very popular in Baghdad. Ibn Musa's codex that became very popular in Basra. And then Zaid Ibn Thabit's codex that became very popular in Medina. So those are the four cities I had always been told. Fascinating. Hatun then came up and says, hold on a minute. That's not what Al-Buhari is saying here. Read it again. To every province. You just read that. Am I there? There it is. Look at it. That's he right. sent one copy of what they had copied in order that to every province. So Uthman sent to every Muslim province. So how many provinces were there at the time of Uthman? 652. I would say it would have been about around nine, if I, my memory is me right. Let, me, let yeah. me name them to you right now and count them as I'm naming them. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, uh, Alexandria. Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. How many have I just said? Nine. Nine. That's nine cities. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. Now, of, that means there were nine copies of the Quran sent to nine cities to nine different countries. Oh, not nine countries, sorry, but nine cities. Those, That's right. That means we should not just find four copies of the Quran. We should find nine copies of the Quran. Am I correct? That is correct. Because we're only talking about 1,400 years ago. That's a very short time. And let me let me add one more thing. Even if you find two of those, they should match each other. If we could even find one of those, that's what I would like to say. Can we find even one of those nine copies from 652? We don't have it's uh, it's absolutely non-existence. 
And that's been very clear. Even the Muslim scholars like Tahir uh, Al-Takulic and Dr. Ikmer al Sanalu have claimed very clearly that neither the Topkapi or the Samarkand or the Ma'il or the Petropolis or the Husseini or the Sana manuscript are from the time of Uthman. None of them are from that time, from 652. They are much, much later. These aren't even copies of that heat, they say. So obviously there has never been found one of those nine copies. Muslims, I would love you to even show me one of those fine copies. That's I would be satisfied with one. But we cannot even find one of them. Now stop and think. Look at those cities again. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. Of those nine cities, all of them were under Islamic control in 652. And except for Jerusalem, they are still under Islamic control. Am I correct, al -Fadi? That is right. And also, those are advanced societies that till today, we still discover things from biblical times in them. How come we don't discover anything from Islamic times? What's even fascinating to me is, I don't recall anywhere in the last 1400 years where those cities outside of Jerusalem have been under warfare, have had any earthquake or have had any deluge, have been destroyed by fire. I don't know of any history that there be any reason that those copies could have been destroyed in the last 1400 years. And if so, why was nothing written about it? And if so, why is it the Muslims could not preserve them? So we're still asking Muslims those nine copies that were then created by Uthman, Zaid ibn Tafid and the other four, three, sent to nine provinces, they should exist today. Yet we can't even find one. Correct. And I've been asking this since, oh, I don't know, since 1994 we've been asking it. We brought it out in the debate in 2014. You and I brought it out last year. We asked the same question uh, there on Sira International on your site and also on Fander Films when we were going through this and unpacking it. And yet no Muslim has been able to answer us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, it's it's a very serious question if you think about it. I mean, we're, we're talking about evidence that prove the existence of the very Quran as we know it. Can you then see how why this from al-Buhari is hugely and highly damaging, but it gets even worse. Let's read on to what happens next. So uh, it says uh, he an order him uh, I wonder where I stopped here. So, okay, so they, they did so. One copy. Uh, say that again, I'm sorry. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied. That's right. So, and he ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burned. And here I have the urge to make a comment, by the way. I thought Zaid, 20 years earlier, collected the Quran from these fragmentary material. Why in the world they still exist? Ah, that's an interesting point. Or where ha where are they? Those bones and stones and palm leaves. That's right. So th that tells me that people didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the order in the first time and kept their own and kept on going with it. So Zaid ibn Thabit added a verse from Surat Ahzab was missed by me. Okay, before you go on to that, let me just say, why would you burn a manuscript? Manuscripts? Uh, well, you know, apparently it disagrees with your copy. That's why you burn it. They burn it because they disagree, is what you're saying. Right. To hide the discrepancies, you've got to destroy those which are discrepant. Correct. Now, do we do that with Bibles? Well, I mean, uh, I'm not aware of any Bible that was burned because it disagreed. We know of a practice that was used to burn just fragments because that's the way to try to make sure no one touches the holy pages. But nowhere in the history of the Bible that we hear of anyone, an emperor, an apostle, a follower, who just decided that this copy of the Bible doesn't agree with this, so I'm going to burn it. Okay, now I will correct you on one thing, and that is there is the Edict of Diocletian in 300 AD, who is a Roman, uh, 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 a Roman, um, not emperor, he was, well, yeah, he, uh, Diocletian was, and he was the one that they took all the manuscripts of the Bible that he could find and had them burnt. 
but that he was not a Christian. He was actually a, this is a persecution of Christians, and this was an eradication. Of that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if you're talking about us doing it, I'm not aware of that. No, we are very clear where the where the, the differences are. We even write it in our Bible. We say where there if there's any discrepancies. We have a long tradition of textual purity and looking back and seeing where they differ. And if so, we make are very transparent about it. Absolutely, and and I tell my Muslim friends when whenever they bring me something from the Bible, for instance, say, "Look, look, your Bible in the footnote says." I said, "Well, uh, well, just ask yourself this question: Where did you get it from?" the copy of the Bible in your hand today. So we didn't hide it. Mark Connell is saying here that we even keep the apocryphal and Gnostic scriptures. Why would we do that since they are completely against everything we believe? Yet we don't burn even the sectarian writings. We don't burn the apocryphal writings. That's why you can still find the apocryphal accounts. Interestingly, that made their way into the Quran, but did not make their way anywhere into the Bible because they were apocryphal. Yet you can go to libraries today. and You can get Jonathan Benuzaida's books. You can get the material from the uh, second Targum of Esther. You can certainly get the material on the the the, Rabba, uh, the, the Mishnah of Rabbah. These are well-known documents. Nobody would destroy them. The Jews would not destroy them. We don't destroy them. Even though they're apocryphal, even though they are heretical, they, they completely confront the Bible. We don't destroy them because we know that these are needed. We need to keep them. We need to preserve everything. Yet and I... I here you have Uthman burning anything that disagreed with the Quran that Zaid ibn Tabit had finally put together. That's right. And, and, and to, to even confirm what you just said about the fact that we didn't burn even those that consider to be extra biblical material, we know Muhammad, Lord bless his heart, used most of them to include in the Quran as well. Fascinating. Okay. That is to me is hugely damaging. Now let's finish off this material and we'll, we'll come to bring this whole thing to an end. Read the last, very last part then. And we have the same issue here. He says, in order that all of the Quranic materials, whether written, fragmentary, uh, or manuscript, or whole copies, be burned. So Zayd ibn Thabit added, a verse from Surat Ahzab, or Surat Al-Ahzab, was missed by me. Wow, notice. He missed something for 20 years, okay? Missed by me when we no, copied the Quran. Not exist. This verse was not in the original Quran, in the first Quran. Now, I wonder how many other verses he missed also. So, <laughs> it says, missed by me, at least the guy was honest. Uh, when we copied the Quran, and I used to hear Allah's apostle reciting it, so we searched for it and found it with Khuzayma ibn Thabit al-Ansari. That verse was, and he recited it, which is chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 23. So, can you see? Here's an admission that the first Quran that he had put together under Abu Bakr and and Umar, which is chapters of uh, volume six, hadith number 509 that we read earlier, this verse didn't exist in that. He is admitting it. That's right. Fascinating. So what Quran are we talking about now? This is not the Quran of Muhammad. This is not the Quran that's in that preserved taught that this is uh, referred to in chapter 85, verse 22. It's not Abu Bakr's Quran. So it's obviously that this is another verse that has to be added. On top of which, we don't know how much more he added from what he had done 20 years earlier. What happened to Hafsa's copy? Well, he said he's returned it, but then later we have another tradition where it was taken from her and burned also. Included. It was burned uh, along with yeah. all these other. So that's, right. that's why you can now understand when you look at even the earliest manuscripts we have today, like the six that I already referred to, when you look at them, you can see that they don't agree with each other. Am I correct? That's right. That's right. They don't agree with each other. None of them are complete. They don't agree with the Quran we have today. You can see that there is an enormous amount of manipulation by men. But I'm not going to, that's for another time, that's for another date. Let's just look at these two and let's wrap it all up now. What are the problems we have found with volume 6, 509, and 510? Go ahead, Al Fadi, and then I'll add and I'll bring it to a conclusion. Uh, very good. So, um, and, and that was it, basically. I just read uh, the, the end of it. He uh, included that verse, chapter 33, verse 23. Now, let's, so we have a problem, number one. It, the first problem is, here you have a, a book that is sent down to a man who didn't really take it that seriously, in that he didn't even write it down. And we know you need to write it down, because memorization is not good enough. Memorization, anybody who had memorized it 
dies. They die in battle. They die in uh, for, for many other reasons. Once they die, their memorization goes with them. To say nothing of the fact, did they even memorize the same thing? How do we even know what one memorized was the same as what the other memorized when we have this real problem of one not even understanding what the other said? And here we find out that it's from two different Ahruf, two different Kidat. But that Ahruf and Kidat are from the time of, of, of the time that Muhammad was still living. This problem with Ahruf and Kidat did not continue after Muhammad died. Because even Muhammad said there were seven of these, seven different readings. That was while he was living. When you have a different Ahruf and Kidat, they, it may, the reading would be different, but not the written. The written would still be a standard rasm. How you read it would t depend on what your dialect is. That's right. And I want to be also, um, uh, you know, uh, I know you know this, Jay, but I just want to tell people that uh, we need to be careful about this tradition about the seven Ahruf because this was a tradition that appeared, as we mentioned, almost 240 years later. And even that tradition about the idea that there were seven ways of reading the Quran or reciting it, seven Ahruf, is questionable because it has a number of problems in its Isnad or its chain of narration and uh, no one can find really anything else to collaborate it beside that particular one okay as we end up i want to just finish with bart Connolly. thank bart yeah i see you're putting them up on your on the text on this on the chat let me go through bart's questions and we'll try to answer them real quickly one by one he's now that we've read both five six five oh nine and six five ten he then asked this question these different verses by Uba ibn Ka'ab and ibn Masud that um, that Arbery talks about. Why is it that they we have different verses? Why is it there are fifteen thousand differences just between these first four codices? What would be your answer to that? You mean why why would do we still have that? He's saying why are they referred to in all these traditions? Well, I mean, it appears to me, I mean, this is just me thinking uh, out loud here, that it appears that uh, we really uh, do not know for a fact that Zaid was able to capture all of these variant readings. So we know of other variant readings that continue to move on beyond those supposed seven. And the, the reason why I'm saying this, because 200 years later, after this supposed collection, uh, we have Ibn Mujahid who collected the so-called the canonical readings, discovered that there is much more than that out there. So that's why we have more of those. And at the same time, the diacritical markings, when it was added, um, you know, it seemed like there wasn't a standardized process. Uh, there is a lot of people that did it their way, and therefore the word could have been read in a different ways as well. Once again, that's a, that's my own injunction here. Okay, now I will take a different spin on this, and I would suggest that this shows us that the earliest exegetes, the earliest leaders and authorities of Islam did not have a problem with a different Qurans. Uh, that too, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Absolutely. More of a modern problem. That's right, that's right. I suggest because it's a modern problem, but, and we've noticed this, that when you start to look at the traditions that Ar Arthur Jeffries uh, refers to, these traditions, by many of them by Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawud, all of them, they're saying very clearly that parts of the Quran were forgotten, parts of the Quran were canceled, other parts were abridged, other parts were changed, some of it was eaten by goats, and they go on and on, a whole list of differences in the Quran, even in one case where you have Ibn, uh, Ibn uh, Al-Hajjaj, Al -Hajjaj, Al -Hajjaj, who is the governor under, yep. under um, Malik, Abdel al-Malik, in Kufa, who in 705, made 11 changes to the Quran. These are well documented. These are coming from right. Islamic tradition. It was almost as if they knew that this was a human-made book and that they were trying to compile it, put it together, and they recognized that Bart, bits and parts of it had to be thrown out. Others had to be added in. Others had to be accreted, deleted. You name it, they had to do it. And that's why the earliest exegetes had no difficulty believing that this was written by men. It's Absolutely. modern Muslims, and I see some of them who are trying to struggle with this. People like uh, there that we that we have to deal with today, who are have made this claim that the Quran is uncreated, that the Quran has never has is eternal, that has never changed, and therefore it has to be unfettered with any human limitation. It cannot be written by man. It cannot be changed by man. So you have compl a complete disconnect here between the earliest exegetes and what the Muslim scholars are saying today. 
That is correct, Jay. And, and you know, when you look at uh, Qurtubi, Tabari, Ibn Kathir, uh, you know, Arazi, and they, they are honest enough to tell you the people of Kufa used to read it this way. The people of Basra used to read it this way. I mean, they're listing it for you in their own writing. And guess what? If they were saying anything taboo, they would have been killed for it because it was in existence in their den. But no, they're reporting something that I agree with you. There was like more open-mindedness at that time. People were accepting the fact that it would have been read in a variety of ways. In their mind, the meaning at least is still almost the same. So therefore we don't have to disagree with each other. Okay, let's go on with another, a few. Bart, we're gonna end off with your questions since you, were, you actually sent these questions ahead of time. He, Bart goes on and he says, when did this modern order of the Quranic text the the surahs and the eyes that we have today when was that standardized how would you answer that one well i mean i uh, jay you know that muslims will jump all over this and say oh it was done during the time of the prophet he would decide where this verse would go and which chapter and so on and so forth i would disagree with that i would say uh if i want to take a shot at it most likely it would have been uthman or even after uthman because we have evidence that even at the time of uthman things were still not clear Things were not finalized or formalized, if you wish. Ask so beyond, the ask beyond Burke keeps on asking what there is only one Quran. There are many readings, but there is only one Quran. So I'm going to ask Asberg, ask beyond Berg, when was that Quran created? What Quran are you talking about? We have six right. completely different earliest Qurans. We have thousands of Qurans now. Even when Mansur Uthman on the ladder admitted a month ago that when I asked uh, this question to him, when does the 114 surahs of the Quran, when do we get 114 surahs exactly like the Quran that we have in our hand today? When did this actually happen? This is what Bart Connolly is asking. His response is by the first century AH, by the first century after the Hijra, which goes up to 719, that's the early 8th century, we can now find 97%. What an admission! That's over a, almost 100 years after Muhammad, they still could only find 97% of the Quran. What he didn't tell us is that is made up from 63 different fragments. By com com accumulating those 63 fragments, they came up with 90, actually it's 96%. What he didn't also tell us is they have not done any study to know whether or not even any of those fragments agreed with the Quran that we have today or agreed right. with each other. Ooh, I love well, I ha well, I have some good news for him. They don't. So, uh, without even looking at it. And the other thing I was going to say, the earliest Quranic manuscript that we're studying right now, the Sana manuscript, uh, the, the chapters are not in the... This is yeah, your manuscript. Exactly. They're not in the same order as today's Quran. So, that's the fifth question that Bart Connolly asked. Why was the order changed? A total of 33,000 companions agreed that every letter of the Quran was in the right place. Where is the record that 33,000 people presented this to this Quran and where were their names? How did they know every word was in the right place if only 70 people were dead after Yamama and all the people who knew large sections of the Quran? I'm not sure, what, Bart Connie, what this 33,000 you're referring to. I've not come across that before. Me, me too. Uh, but, but it, it Bert, it, you're basically admitting, my friend, that the Quran is a man made product as we know it today. That's all. Yeah, and then, then he goes on and says, how can we have different additions survive to this day, such as the adding of, and he, Muhammad, is the father of them and the believers. Listen, Bart, you're bringing up a whole new kettle. You're bringing up a whole new can of worms. Sorry. Uh, this is, uh, wait till we get to that. We're going to show you that even the Sana manuscript that, uh, that Al-Fadi is talking about, the lower script does not agree with the upper script. That's and right. The differences between this palimpsest, there are 63 verses 70 differences within those 63 verses with the Quran we have today. Wait till you see how different they are. Al-Fadi and I will be actually doing some programs just on the Sana'a and looking at the palimpsest. You're going to laugh when you see how different they are, how they have changed. Not only do they change the text, they change the meaning. Not only do they change the meaning, they change the theology. Ooh, I love it. But that's for another time, another live stream, another date. We'll get back to that. But good question. Thank you for doing that. You want to add anything to that, Al-Fadi? Not at all. I think uh, we covered uh, the essentials today, and I am excited that we are going to continue uh, in the future to keep digging deeper into the history of the Quran. Yeah, and of course, the last question he asks is, why, why is it we just don't have Abu Bakr's copy? I think after today, you realize there's no way we could have had Abu Bakr's copy because there was no Quran at Abu Bakr. That Quran was burnt, destroyed by Uthman. We don't even have Uthman's Quran. 
evidently those nine copies that were sent to nine cities, all of which nine, eight of them still exist in Muslim hands today, uh, they were so inept they could not hang on to them. They could not hold on to them. There is not even one copy of those that were sent to those nine cities. I'm so glad we don't have this problem with the Bible. I'm so glad we preserve our Bible better than that. I'm so glad we aren't just dependent on six copies of the, 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 the New Testament. We have almost 24,000 that we can go to in uh, 9,000 in uh, uh, Greek, I'm uh, sorry, 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin Vulgates, 9,000 in other languages, in 11 other languages, and we have about 19,800 of the different translations of that. We have 65,000, sorry, 85,000 of the early church fathers' quotations. Correct. 36,000 of them predate the fourth century. That's 300 years before the Quran. And just looking at that 36,000 that predates the fourth century, if you look at the Gospel of John, the most, the one the Muslims hate the most, if you just look at the Gospel of John, we can recreate the entire Gospel of John just from those quotations from before the fourth century outside of the manuscript evidence and still reproduce the entire Gospel of John except for 11 verses. Ooh, I love my Bible. Amen. And that's why it's so good being be asking. We have done our homework with the Bible. Muslims, you need to start doing your homework with the Quran. We are allowed to ask these questions. We have to ask these questions. We need to bring this to an end because I see that we have now gone over over an hour and a half. So we need to bring it to an end. Do you want to say one last thing before we end? There's about 160 people who are watching right now live. Well, I want to thank all of them, of course, and those that will be watching us uh, later on, uh, whether today or later. Uh, folks, uh, uh, this is serious uh, because uh, you, there is a life of 1.6 billion Muslims that depends on this book that we are critiquing right now. And we would just want you, when you reach out to Muslims or share this with them or our Muslim friends who are listening to this, to just take the evidence where it leads you. We are presenting facts to you that are available these days in books, in writings. Uh, it's not hidden anymore. You can say, uh, you know, search for it yourself, chase it yourself, and just go back and double check every single reference we gave you. We're not really talking out of our minds here. We're showing you on the screen where we are coming up with these ideas about how the Quran was collected. So my hope is that our Muslim friends, uh, you know, will begin to seriously critique this book that they believe to be divine. al Fadi, it's been great having you. Bart, I've used an awful lot of your questions today. Uh, I see your last comment here uh, where you're saying very clearly that it looks like, looks like they had nothing. They never had a Quran, and they just made up a story about having them in the 9th century and then anachronously redacted it back to the 7th century. That's a good way to uh, to summarize exactly what we've been saying today. Almost everything that we brought out in Volume Six, Five Hundred Nine, and Five Ten is a redaction of what Uthma, uh, Abu, I'm sorry, Al Bukhari thought happened in the seventh century. That's why he made mistake after mistake. We now have done our historical studies. We know where these mistakes are. I would suggest that. Muslims, this is not only the first two Qurans that we're talking about. We're going to start talking about different manuscripts. We're going to zero in on some of the anachronisms of those manuscripts. We're going to talk about the Sana'a manuscript in, in time to come. But until then, I would suggest you go to Siddha International. Go to Al-Fadi's site. Can you say a little bit about what we're doing right there now, Al-Fadi, before we end? What's going on on your site? Absolutely. So me and Jay uh, just finished a brand new uh, a video series, actually, one that has just been released right now, which is about the uh, 20 correction in early Quran manuscript based on the book of Dr. Daniel Brubaker. So we did a number of shows. I think we did about eight or nine. We also did another series about the uh, refute in the Quranic, uh, the scientific miracles of the Quran. And we revisited the unknown history of Islam that is based on Dan Gibson's mu uh, material. But what we did is we looked at the different objections that were raised to date, and uh, we refuted David all of them. Dr. David King has been some good, uh, some actually very valid uh, objections to what Dan Gibson has done, and Dan Gibson has answered every one of them. So we did a smattering of some of those objections. Again, uh, after November, we're going to add some more to that because new have new material right. has come up. And we're going to keep adding. This is the great thing about this, isn't it, al -Fari? We just Amen. keep adding answers, responses to every one of these objections. Amen. And so me and Jay will be doing another round of these uh, shows, uh, I believe, in December. And we will do a couple of live shows. So we'll keep you posted.
Okay, here's the book that Al Fadi is talking about. Please go get it. Dr. Dan Brubaker has this is the only book that has ever done this. Nobody has dared to do what Dr. Dan Brubaker did. No one has dared to look at these corrections. No one has dared to publish. There is no Muslim author, there's no Islamic author who has even done this work. No one has even looked to see. He has found 4,000 of these corrections in all the major earliest manuscripts. There's just 22. Actually, it says 20, but there's actually 22. We've asked him to add two more that he's added in there as well. Damaging, absolutely. And no Muslim has been able to even answer these 22. It's only been out for about a month. Go get it. Look at it. Understand it. And then go look at both at Sita International. And then from uh, we will be putting those those discussions that uh, Al Fadi and I have Al Fadi and I have doing with Sita International. We'll also be uploading them here on Fander Films. But first, they are going to be on Sita International. Go and look at them. Unpack them. Get excited by them, and then send them to others. Subscribe to Al Fadi's uh, site. Please subscribe. C I R A International Correct. on YouTube. And then also listen. Uh, guys and gals, we can't do what we're doing without getting funds. We do need to have funds. We do need to have support. Please support Al Fadi's. Uh, you have both Patreon and PayPal. Am I correct? Absolutely, and sa same to you, brother. I mean, uh, we we both in the same boat, basically. Okay. I would love to go to the homepage of both Sita International and Fander Films. We have a button there, Patreon button. And we also have PayPal button. You can. Send uh, money on a monthly basis, or you can do a one-off with PayPal, or send it on a monthly basis with Patreon. Uh, we we are dependent on that to keep going, not only to do these live streams, but mainly to do the research that we're doing. That's Our right. Buddy is doing the virginal research. He is the only one that's doing what he's doing. We're bringing it together, tabulating together, and getting it out so that all of you can benefit from them. Those of you who are watching today. Others who will be watching it from here on out, because this will be put up onto both Fander films. I'll sit out where you you could be putting this up as well. That means that people can benefit from it. But we do need to get funded. God bless you for those who are already doing it. I have about eighty-five uh, patrons now who are who are funding uh, uh, Fander films. Thank you for that. God bless you. I'm in contact with every one of you, and it's just. Uh, in, uh, encourages both of us to know that you people think that what we're doing is that important that you'd like to support us. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. And uh, I love what you do. And uh, indeed, we want people to consider supporting Fander Films also because, uh, you know, w w uh, one thing I respect about Jay is he really doesn't need to stick his neck out there in, in such a risky business. But he does it because he loves also the Muslim people. He's not doing it because he has an agenda against them. He's rather want them to, uh, let me say, wake up from the deep dream. You know, wake up and just realize that everything they believe about their history and their book and their man is questionable. Okay, great. God bless you all. This has been terrific. Uh, we're going to close out this session. It'll still be up there. You can still make comments. Put comments at the bottom. We love the comments. We do read them. Uh, we have people who are actually responding to them. I call them my armchair evangelists. They're all over the world. They're not just here. We have them in many different countries who do like to engage with you on this. Because this is, the, this is in some ways, what Al-Fadi and I are doing is getting the material out there so that you can engage with it, so you can debate it and discuss it in a public contest. God Amen. bless you. It's been great thank being you. with you. Al-Fadi, thanks again. We'll be thank doing you. it for another two weeks when I get back uh, from South America. Okay. Thank you. Hey. And Al-Fadi. Over and out. Bye-bye.